on white, opaque, flexible plexiglass. plexiglass. Sorry, I'll say that again. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's Elliot. And Todd. Welcome to Two Designers Walk Into a Bar, an ongoing conversation about pop culture and iconic design. Today we continue talking about the formation of the pop art scene. And the introduction of its greatest superstar. He made the lowbrow highbrow. And along the way agitated a lot of people. So let's raise our glasses to the master manipulator himself back here in the bar. So we're back in the bar, right? We're back in the bar. Uh huh. Yep. We uh, sure here are. We are. Here we are. Here we are. So, Elliot, yes. do you have a favorite album cover of all time? Oh wow. Uh, hmm. I'm not sure I can. It's like Lay's potato chips. I'm not sure it could be just one, right? Oh, I, I thought you meant you like salty album covers. No. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that reminds me of a story with you with a bag of chips. Uh, let's let's don't go into that right now. Oh, okay. I ask a question, you can answer. Okay, uh, a few pop into my head as you ask the question. So, one that is sort of iconic from, um, you know, well, actually several I think from when I was in high school or in college, yeah. or heck, even in middle school for one of these. Now that I think about it, so uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Blood Sugar, Sex Magic. I mean, that was oh, yeah. you know pretty amazing. Um, a lot of uh, Vaughn Oliver's work for bands like the Pixies, mm. all his symbolism and things like that. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I really like that. And I'm going to drop a little hint here because in future episodes, we will be talking about some of his work. Ooh. So stick a pin in that. Easter egg. <laughs> and then the, the Beastie Boys first album, the plane crashing and licensed to ill. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And then collages from the Dead Kennedys. We've talked about Winston K. Smith and his work. We do love Winston K. Smith, don't we? Yes. So I would say I you know, I don't know if I can and I'm not even gonna get into, you know, some of like the metal bands from the seventies and the eighties, some of which yeah, we yeah. touched on with our bar snacks with our friends. I mean, we could be here all day just talking about this. Um, yeah, but nevertheless, I mean, in the age of digital downloads, it's really kind of a a lost art form, right? You know, it's not yeah, it's yeah. not it's a postage stamp, right? But I think part of the vinyl resurgence we've been seeing, is because people miss it or, you know, younger people are discovering it. Well, you're 100% right. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, I just read in Billboard that vinyl is still growing, believe it or not, to the point of 43.46 million vinyl albums were sold in 2022 in the U.S. That's 17 consecutive years of vinyl album growth. And here's the interesting thing. That's 43.4% of all albums in 2022 were vinyl. Wow, so almost one in two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, That's crazy. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's all about that experience, that tangibility, the size, mm -hmm, the fact mm -hmm. that you're buying a thing, right? It's yeah, not zeros yeah. and ones buried somewhere in your phone or whatever. It's an actual thing. And of course, you and I love design, we love artifacts, and I think it's that whole experience of the package. I mean, we just, of course, when we were talking about the beats, we were talking yeah. about all the different album covers, the illustrations, the typography, the printing, um, and just that whole experience. And wow, I mean, just the illustration, just everything, right? So the print production in terms of things like 
die cuts or stickers, mm-hmm, uh, I mean, mm-hmm. holograms or uh, things like lenticular printing, right? Which is, of course, the little sort of ribbed plastic animations that are on, you know, <laughs> when you uh, right, probably right. a lot of people, if, if you're familiar with that, you would have gotten like a Cracker Jack prize or something. That right, that right, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. I was going to ask you to explain to the listeners who maybe didn't know what lenticular was, but you did a great job. It's the ribbed thing that looks animated. Um, But you're right. Like, it's an experience, right? And I think we're longing for that stuff now. And, you know, I remember um, vinyl records for bands that I liked, and I would stare at the uh, artwork and interpret what it was saying as I was listening to the music you know and I think that that's I think that was like a complete artist statement and you know it is a little bit of a lost art um, and we're gonna kind of dig into that a little bit today because we're gonna talk about the master of that uh, as we continue talking about our series of pop art and Andy Warhol in the factory Um, because We've talked about the highlights, the good parts of Andy Warhol's factory, and we've talked about kind of the downside of that. But today we're going to get into some specific pop culture highlights that came out of that scene. And we're going to put a major pin in a big old deal. You know the album from 1967, The Velvet Underground and Nico? Yeah, it's uh, slightly familiar. Just one of the most iconic album designs in history. 100%. So Andy Warhol was managing the Velvet Underground at the time. So we're returning to the factory at 1966. So the halcyon years of the factory, they were becoming super commercially successful. Mm, Still a sideshow, right? (laughs) Well, yeah. I mean, they couldn't get away from that, right? (laughs) Um, So musicians came calling. Andy Warhol did what he did. Uh, he turned something throwaway and utilitarian into a controversial piece of art and a keepsake. Uh, he made things cool. And this particular album was the debut, and it was released on March 12th, 1967. The Velvet Underground and Nico, it was their iconic first brash of album of music by these soon to become alternative granddaddies the velvet underground so nico was a little bit of an add-on this was uh, something kind of funny i didn't know if you know this but nico was a german model and uh and a muse that was added by andy warhol for sellability you know for for glamour if you will he was all about some glamour uh, he knew the glam and the album was actually recorded in the previous year while the band was on the uh, Exploding Plastic Inevitable tour. Have you heard of that? A little bit. Uh, so, yeah, Exploding Plastic Inevitable, sort of uh, what? Part music, obviously, was in there. Mm-hmm, I think mm-hmm. there were maybe some movies, but it was also mm-hmm. kind of a scene or kind of a happening. I mean, what is it sort of like... Uh, I don't know, like Lollapalooza or something. Like, what would you? Well, <laughs> is it is it Coachella? Like, what what's the modern equivalent of this thing? I think it's Cirque du Soleil on acid. I think oh. that would be. Oh, is that, that would, all? That would encapsulate it. It was a <laughs> bunch of crazy crap happening at one time to the Velvet Underground's music. So I, I tell you what, uh, we're gonna get back on the path of album covers in just a second. But I think it's worth talking about the exploding plastic inevitable. Because there was nothing like it before, and uh, certainly a lot of things influenced since then. What it was was a series of multimedia happenings. Mm, Okay. Not only featuring the music of The Velvet Underground and Nico, but they also featured screenings of Warhol's films, along with, I'm doing air quotes here, if you can see, dancing and performances by factory regulars. (laughs) So, you know, it was like... (laughs) Okay, but initial shows were done at this club called the Dom in New York City, down in the East Village. The Dom was at 19 through 23 St. Mark's Place, and they were done throughout April. Uh, Actually done for many months, but that's where it started, was in April of 1966. Okay, so this is going on before this out you know you mentioned oh yeah, the yeah, album yeah was released yeah. but even before it was recorded it sounds like yeah exactly exactly okay. and so the thing that 
you talked about, like with uh, the Velvet Underground being sort of like uh, very iconic alternative music yeah. that really did sort of set the pace for a lot of artists, but um, it wasn't Andy's first rock experiment, as I, I came to learn. Um, and you're going to love this. You're going to love this. Okay, I, hit, you hit don't me, know this story, but I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I'm curious now. I'm going to tell you something that will make you want to get kicked out of an Outback Steakhouse right now. So, Again? Uh, yeah. Okay. So as early as 1963, Andy was forming a band called the Druds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, wait a minute. Wait till you hear who was in the band, dude. All right. Okay. Klaus Oldenburg and his wife, Patty. <laughs> All right. Jasper Johns. Uh-huh. Uh, this happening artist, Lucas Samaras. Okay. Uh, minimalist sculpture, Walter D. Maria, uh, minimalist composer, Lamonte Young, and painter Larry Poons. And so Klaus Oldenburg's wife, Patty, sang lead. Occasionally, Andy did too. And Jasper oh, wow. Johns. Oh, okay. I, I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hold on. It gets better. Jasper Johns and Andy wrote the lyrics. <laughs> and some of Andy's songs were movie stars, Hollywood, and Coca Cola. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have so many questions. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess the first one is, do recordings of this exist? Can you find I have this not. Anywhere? You know, that was my first question, and I have not found anything uh, at all. So maybe they were wise and destroyed those recordings. Oh, man. We, gotta, we, we might have to do some deep research. Okay. And then I guess my second question is, were these guys the – first uh true art rock band you know probably or the first one of any note um you know but again the the first commercially sort of successful was uh the velvet underground but sure let's, let's sure. talk a little bit about well, that's that. the that's sort of the whole med and art school kind of thing right I yeah mean, there's, yeah we could do a whole yeah. Heck, there probably is a podcast series about bands that met in art school. <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't have Talking Heads if it wasn't for... Wouldn't have Queen. I mean, there's a number of bands we wouldn't have. Rolling Stones, right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. So this sounds like it was maybe not the greatest thing in the world if recordings don't exist of it. Because you would think Andy, the guy who saved everything, he would have certainly saved this stuff if it had been decent. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. But maybe he got distracted when the Velvet Underground and Nico came along. And um, regardless, so let's talk about this album. It was experimental. I think you would say that. It was um, kind of odd performances by Lou Reed and Mo Tucker, Sterling Morrison, and, of course, uh, the great John Cale, mm -hmm. who rocked his electric viola, <laughs> as well as some controversial experimental lyrics including drug abuse, prostitution, a little sadomasochism, and sexual deviancy. So these guys were really sort of children of the beats in the truest sense, it sounds yes, like. Yes, 100%. Total, like Lou Reed, who was the lyricist, was totally inspired by the beat writers, uh, who, you know, he kind of continued their tradition of bringing America's underbelly to pop culture. Love it. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, picking up where where your buddies uh, Ginsburg, Kerouac, Burroughs left off and making money off of it, too. Right. Um, so I think it's pretty well known that uh, Andy was their manager, was the Velvet Underground's manager. <laughs> Are you still doing air quotes? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So as the manager, he was able to say, well, I'm going to design the uh, cover for your debut album. So it's pretty, I mean, it's very iconic mm -hmm. album cover features i'll describe it and it's pretty simple to describe features a large yellow banana on a white background and the artist's name is really big in the bottom right hand corner like he has signed the the banana painting <laughs> <laughs> but no mention of the band name on their debut album <laughs> isn't there a layout of this that dancing around that when it was reissued i think it dawned on everybody they should probably add the band's name yes on <laughs> yes on the reissue yeah yeah they, so they like did if people the... are looking this up my point is the original yeah the only name on it is andy warhol <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know isn't that great it was their debut album 
It's a very sort of spinal tap moment, right? It is. It is. Okay, but it gets better. So at the top of the banana was a pretty tiny type that read, Pill slowly and see. And the, the cover's banana peel was actually a real vinyl sticker that listeners could peel down and reveal the hidden pink flesh tone banana uh, under the peel. Yeah, it was like the guts of the banana, but it was colored pink. Right, right. Yeah. You noticing anything in that? Uh, I, you know, it's it's pretty subtle, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there might be a little bit of a nod to oh, I don't know, a certain phallic form. I think you're right. Well, the cover caused quite a stir, and it's iconic. You know, pretty much nailed Andy, right, on, yep. on what he's good at. Yep. Uh, and as a matter of fact, in 2022, Billboard rated it the best cover of all time. Wow. And they said it was raunchy, playful, and interactive. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, nailed it. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Let's, let's back up a step, though. Okay. Like a banana... Uh, yeah. I mean, okay, I get it. You got to peel it, whatever, peeling a sticker. But, I mean, a hot dog, I think, would have been much more, maybe more people would have caught on, right? Or it would have been, maybe that could have even been a bit more controversial. Maybe, yeah. Um, well, you know, there's a couple th- things in that that uh, kind of start making a little bit of sense. Bananas had been uh, a kind of theme in one of Andy Warhol's earliest features called Harlot by Mario Montez. And it's mostly used as a comedic phallic symbol. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) I said it. I said it. Okay. And also, you know, Donovan's song, Mellow Yellow. They call it Mellow Yellow. Yeah, you got it. You got it. So, yeah, there was a connection there. Sure. Yeah, I mean... The mellow yellow thing is so funny because it wasn't that kind of like a another kind of Puff the Magic Dragon song. Like, wasn't it seen as sort of deviant? It was, actually, because the uh, the Velvet Underground album had drug-related songs, um, such as subversive titles like Heroin. And <laughs> I, I, I don't know if that's subversive. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty... I, I, I mean, it's kind of sneaking it in there a little bit. Oh, okay. Uh, and then I'm waiting for the man. Mm-hmm. Um, so some interpreted the cover as a reference to that old schoolyard rumor that smoking banana peels will get you high. You know, who uh, knows if that was Warhol's intent or yeah, not. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't know. I guess... <laughs> This is another one of those situations where you wonder if the people who are looking at potential drug symbolism, you're wondering what drugs they were doing (laughs) to find (laughs) the symbol. I think, uh, forget about the banana peel thing, but, uh, you know, regardless, kids, stay away from the drugs. That's right. It's a public service announcement that you're doing there. Yeah, uh, this is uh, a very special episode of Two Designers Walk Into a Bar. That's right. We don't know if banana peels will get you high, but don't do drugs, kids. That's right. Um, Man, wouldn't it be great if, if Nancy Reagan were still alive? It would be. We it could would ask be. her to be a guest. That's right. That's right. And then we would get into, like, our, our brains being eggs and then our brains fried being our, uh, I mean, our eggs being fried. See, I, I can't even do it. I'm, Man, I'll tell you I'm what, already though, messed up. I know. I'll tell you. Plantains fried, they're kind of like bananas. Those are pretty good. They are. And you know what? They're very tasty. And I don't know that I get high, but I really do enjoy them. Yeah, you have a full tummy. That's true. But, okay, so you ask about the design. So Andy didn't fuss too much about designing stuff. And as a matter of fact, I think we've we've heard already that he even said, don't worry about what the critics are saying or how people are, are responding to what you're doing. Just do it and let them sort it out. And that's what he did. <laughs> More of an idea man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just an idea dude. Um, so he just, he didn't fuss over stuff. And... He thought it was something that was pretty super average um, that everyone was familiar with, and he uh, put it in a new provocative context, as you might say. Um, Plus, 
he had already created that art a year earlier. And <laughs> Pull it back and off the shelf. <laughs> that's right. Not one to let an idea get completely squeezed. You know, Warhol said, I'll do multiple versions of this same banana. So in 1966, he first used the same banana image for a series of silkscreen prints. Um, they were actually sounding kind of cool on white, opaque, flexible plexiglass. And they were huge. They were about two feet by five feet. So have you found any of these? Like, are these on the market? I've never heard of Yes. Them. Yes. So these also had uh, stickers that you could peel off. <laughs> okay. They were screened on this plexiglass, um, glossy yellow uh, stickers. And I just, I looked up and Christy sold one in 2012 for $92,500. Man, first, Todd, you can't get the dogs playing poker. And now <laughs> I know. now you can't get an oversized banana. I mean, what's the world come to? You know, it's uh, it's just not right. It's just not right is what it is. Yeah. Um, uh, well, you know, I almost wonder, as we're talking about it, if by throwing this artwork on these albums that were going to be distributed everywhere and Andy Warhol throwing his name on the front, if he's like, hey, this will be a great promo for my art <laughs> and, and, oh, get a free record. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? But bananas, I mean, come on, let's do bananas. Like, yeah, I, okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely still intrigued by the whole banana idea. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you. And, man, I believe the bartender just heard you, and I think you're getting a banana daiquiri. Oh, well, that'll be great. It'll go perfectly with the two buttery nipples I just ordered and put on your tab. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Hi. We want to take a moment to mention that if you're enjoying this episode, we have an archive of topics ranging from the Olympics to movie posters. Think Ghostbusters. Iconic images. Think Bigfoot. Punk music. The Ramones. Saturday morning cartoons. The Pink Panther. And failed products like OK Soda. Visit our website at twodesignerswalkintoabar.com for full episode notes and visuals the latest blog content, and to sign up for our newsletter. Follow us on social media. We can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Find the links on our website or search using the phrase two designers walk into a bar. Most importantly, leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps more people like you find podcasts like this. And tell a friend about us. Send them a link to our podcast from your listening platform of choice. And if you're inclined, buy our merchandise. Stickers, coasters, magnets, T-shirts. We're designers. We make good stuff, and it helps support the show. Get in touch. Use the contact form on our website or send an email to hello at twodesignerswalkintoabar.com. We read every message we get. Honest. And we're available for speaking gigs. Email us to learn more. Okay, now back to the bar. Okay, Todd, as I mentioned a minute ago, I'm still intrigued by the whole banana idea. I, no truer words were ever spoken, right? <laughs> Was it just breakfast time for this cat? It's like there's a banana or, again, this artwork was lying around. Do we photograph it and call it a day? I mean, why did he <laughs> – why a banana in the first place? I mean – Well, yeah. I mean, if it was, like, normal, that would be boring, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, that's – no. Oh, man. This is so funny. You're going to love this because I dug up a really interesting story about this. The image of the banana, you may find this funny, was actually not created by Andy Warhol. It was lifted from one of those old triangle-shaped tin ashtrays that you would find in a tire shop somewhere. <laughs> what? Yeah, That's yeah, awesome. exactly. That's crazy. And now, okay, and you know how I love a thread that ties things together. Yeah. The bass player for Danzig <laughs> is the one who put this together. <laughs> Art detective bass player. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So there's a blog called Dangerous Minds Blog, and um, Michelle Pfeiffer edits it, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Howie Pyro, R.I.P. The bass player for Danzig published an article in 2017 about his discovery 30 years earlier at this cool junk shop in East Village. Um, here, let me, I'll read you an excerpt of it. <laughs> All okay? right, hit, hit me. Okay. Um, and, I mean, just 
buckle up because you know it's <laughs> it's bananas passed through the Danzig bass player. So All right. yeah. it's like I found some old records, a huge stash of outrageous and disgusting tabloid newspapers from the '60s, which I kept buying there for a couple months afterwards, and some cool old knickknacks. I knocked into something on a crowded table full of junk and heard a big clang on the cement floor. I bent over it to pick it up, and it was one of those cheap triangular tin ashtrays that usually advertise car tires, see, told you, or something mundane. I picked it up, because it was face down, and when I turned it over, it was surprised to see the banana. It was an ad for bananas printed on the cheap metal ashtray. The ashtray, the ashtray read, don't you like banana? <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy banana. <laughs> Presented by Wing Corp, designed by Leo Kono Production. <laughs> what the hell? So not only an absurd phallic reference for an album cover, it was actually lifted from a tin ashtray produced in China. Oh man, just just <laughs> you know what, Todd? I I hate to say it, but we keep peeling back the layers. Oh, I oh, see. I'm gonna let you get away with that one because that was too good. But you're right. Uh, we just we cannot get enough of the banana, can we? No. Yeah. The story just keeps getting better and better. It does. It does. Okay. Let's uh, let's set that aside. Let's set the banana aside for a second. I'm gonna switch gears here real quick and talk about another prolific creative that made his career designing for the record and entertainment industry, and. He plays an important part in this story because, as we said, this was the Velvet's debut record, and it was rejected by eh, basically everybody. <laughs> Columbia Records, <laughs> Atlantic Records, Electra Records. And I know you're going to ask, Todd, why was it rejected by so many record companies? Well, they said, they cited reasons. They were like, well, there's a little too many drug references, and we just can't take John Gale's viola. <laughs> <laughs> so Andy Warhol, as manager, is only so persuasive, as it turns out. That's right. That's right. Few people saw the, uh, the joy of Andy Warhol's management. But ultimately, the Velvets... Uh, landed at Verve Records and the project of their head designer, a guy named A.C. Rudy Lehman. Okay, A.C. Well, this is, so Verve Records, that's great because, of course, Verve yeah. was a very seminal jazz label. Yes, yes. And, you know, and you, okay, so they drop there. Okay, so they're, you know, maybe Verve is a little more open-minded to alternative forms of music. So that, okay, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll believe that. But okay. I'll tell you what I'm not going to believe. AC? <laughs> that was the guy's name? Come on. It was the guy's name. That was his um that was his uh real name. He was like the second and I, I don't quote me on this kids because I think I saw this but I I didn't write it down. I think his dad uh, who was, you know, A.C. Rudy Lehman the first? I think he went by the name Crapper or something like that. <laughs> so, so even you know, he, he, didn't... he thought A.C. was too cool. He's like, yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. I know. I, I know. I, I, I should have written that down, but I think I saw that somewhere that his dad was, uh, you know, uh, had a had a, quite an adventurous name. But anyway. Let's get back to AC for a second. We're taking detour upon detour here to talk about this album cover. Because if it wasn't for AC, we would never have known about this. He was the head designer, and he agreed on a really unusual and terribly expensive gatefold cover for this one single debut record, this album. He also agreed on Warhol's signed artwork, and Pillable Banana on the front without the name of the band <laughs> mentioned. So this was purposeful. Like, so Warhol yeah, was like, hey, yeah. this is how it's going to go down. And he was yeah. like, that sounds good. Yeah, and, and AC was no chump. You know, he started at RCA. He went to Verve, and of course, at the time of the Velvets. Mm -hmm. Then ultimately went back to RCA to lead their creative department. And after, he, covered... after he bankrupted Verve with all his <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. No, we're teasing. Verve is still around. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he he tested it, right? <laughs> That's um, right. <laughs> but in 
But his album covers have received no less than eight Grammy nominations and even won one in 1972 for the cover of, I know this is one of your favorite albums, the Siegel Schwal Band. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna have to look that one up. That's obscure That's right. even for me. Hey, it's, uh, I, I double-checked that fact. So uh, the Siegel Schwal Band was hip in 1972. So, mm, okay. uh, But AC went on to work for the Velvets and for Lou Reed solo. He did... Uh, several of the Velvet Underground's albums, um, like White Light, White Heat, in 1968. He did four of Lou Reed's solo albums, along with about 600 other albums. Holy smokes. Okay, so no slouch. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so AC, he knew album covers, but mm -hmm. why is that important here? Okay, so why are we talking about AC? Yeah, yeah. Was he, was he basically the... The, the grease on the skids that allowed this album to see the light of day? I mean, was he sort of the gatekeeper here? That's a good way to say it, yes. He was the the guy that said, hey, Verve, let's, let's really invest in this because this band is, is kind of fresh and it's kind of new, and they've got Andy Warhol doing their cover, and we can do something about that. So much so that special machinery was needed to manufacture the covers with the, uh, the gatefold and the pillable sticker. And it caused this album to be considerably delayed, like a year delayed. But AC thought the connection to Warhol was seen as a major key to their success, and he secured the investment by Verb, believing that connection to um, the iconic artist would greatly boost the sales of the album. Hmm. All right. <laughs> Unfortunately, this was a pretty laborious process. So if you can imagine, someone had to sit there with piles of albums and yellow banana skin stickers and place them over the pink fruit by hand. Holy cow. So this <laughs> it is, was a lot of work. Yeah, this is before they were shrink wrapped or any of that stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, what was the, yeah. Do you know what the first run of this album was? How many units they produced? I don't know exactly how many units that they produced, but it was it's pretty well known. It was poorly, um, it was poorly received at the time. I think um, I'm gonna say twenty, thirty thousand units uh, when it was initially. Uh, run so so some poor bastard is... had to sit in <laughs> Verve's basement somewhere yeah. and stick 30,000 bananas which is a lot if you're you know temp labor but for a record company you're kind of like come on dude we need more than that right <laughs> it's probably the mailroom guy I know I know yeah um, but the this, this sort of poor performance really strained uh, Warhol and Lou Reed's relationship after that so <laughs> now, again, manager in air quotes. Yeah, right, right. Manager, banana peel, labeler, um, opportunist artiste. potentially. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you know what? Recently, I saw on eBay um, one of the unpeeled versions of this album. The original pressing went. Well, I'm seeing a couple of them. They're going from about two thousand to four thousand dollars. So. Not bad for an album that originally cost two ninety eight at Woolworths back in nineteen sixty seven, right? Well, well, I'm not sure Woolworths would have stopped them. I mean, you probably have to go <laughs> yeah. to like your local, you know, head shop slash record store to pick it up. Okay, so this begs the question: uh, two to four k on eBay. You couldn't get the dogs playing poker. You couldn't no. get the giant uh, banana. Are you going to pick up one of these? Well, you know. Oddly enough, um, we do have opportunities to buy this artwork, um, but it, it is not in its original form. And, uh, you know, I think you're probably asking, have we talked too much about this banana? <laughs> well, okay, you, you, you read between the lines. Yeah, <laughs> so <clears throat> we've talked more about less, of course, but, and this is iconic, we've talked about, that i mean you know everybody know like if people don't already have this in their heads as soon as you visit our episode page or you google it or whatever you'll say oh yeah that so i mean it's 
iconic in the pantheon of album covers, certainly iconic for Velvet Underground, sort of, you know, made them known, maybe not as known as they would have liked to have been, maybe not mm-hmm. in the way they mm-hmm. would have liked to have been. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, the banana. So hit me with, you know, why this still matters today. Yeah, well, you said something there important, that the banana has become kind of well-known symbol of the Velvet Underground. And well, there was a little <laughs> legal contention with that. Here we go. Todd's, Here we go. Todd's, I know. Todd's latest uh, design <laughs> slash artist slash legal uh, skirmish. Okay. I know, man. I'm like C-SPAN man, for creative. Man, you bury the lead uh, in all these stories, by the way. Well, no, this is, this is good. This And this answers your earlier question. Um, so in January of 2012, the and I'm doing quotes again, the Velvet Underground Business Partnership by John Kale and Lou Reed sued the Andy Warhol Foundation on the basis of copyright infringement, trademark infringement, and unfair competition because the Warhol Foundation had licensed the banana design for things like iPhone covers and bags and plates and, you know, everything. Yeah, sure. So the suit alleged the banana was a symbol of the band, and as such gave the band claim to it but this is funny yeah i don't know yeah the legal conundrum uncovered the fact that the banana design was never registered with the copyright office (laughs) and nothing really came of the court case they reached a private settlement which means you know somebody paid somebody something to be quiet (laughs) and the (laughs) and the federal judge dismissed the case ruling that both parties could uh, ultimately use the banana design. Now that you say this, I vaguely remember, I think I read an article in like the Guardian or something about this. And I think it was, yeah, it was like when iPhone covers came out, it was when the shit yep. hit the fan. If I yep, remember correctly. Yep, yep. That's when they started flipping out. But hey, I mean, it's kind of funny if you think about it, right? Like if Warhol was the manager uh, and he was the creator, I mean, yeah, it would default to him anyway because it's you know he's illustrator he owns you know it's not work for hire right it wasn't like he was working for verve or whatever yeah yeah but poor leo kono who designed the original <laughs> ashtray is, right this was is lost where i was history. going yeah, yeah that yeah where's leo and all this leo know, should, should be getting a royalty here i know the world of ashtray design man it's well, just not respected you know what like so many creative ashtray geniuses oh which reminds me can i tell you a quick story about some of my elementary school art classes <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I guess i'm not gonna get away from it am i <laughs> <laughs> well tell you what you buy me a drink and we'll we'll have a conversation uh, oh my gosh oh my gosh um i tell you what uh let's close up today's episode talking about the banana and on our next episode we're going to talk even more about warhol's influence on music and album cover design and among many other tasty tidbits you know we're going to be asking and answering the question whose crotch is that on sticky fingers (laughs) (laughs) oh wow yeah speaking of sticky fingers Hey, why don't you uh, roll on over to the bar and order us some wings? Uh, Yeah, I thought you were just going to ask me to buy you another drink. Oh, well, as long as you brought that up, sure. Uh, Okay, till next time. See everybody. (laughs) Bye-bye.